Good morning, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Natasha Oshamirsky. I'm the State Director for Massachusetts at the Education Trust, and I am delighted to join the MassInc polling group this morning in sharing new data on the experiences of families and students in our schools throughout Massachusetts. This spring, the MassInc polling group surveyed parents, asking them how their child was doing academically, socially, and emotionally, and about how their child's school was doing to address their concerns. Now, importantly, this is the sixth in a series of polls that the Mass Inc. polling group has conducted, starting all the way back at the beginning of the pandemic. This allows us to not just get a snapshot of how families are feeling, but also to look at how families' experiences with schools have changed over time. After a presentation of the poll results, we will hear from a panel of education experts and conclude with a question and answer portion. So please feel free to use the Q&A function in this Zoom to submit your questions. Staff will be on standby to field some of your questions in real time. Others will be answered during the Q&A portion toward the end of the, of the presentation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Steve Casella, uh, president of the MassInc Polling Group. Steve, over to you. Thank you, Natasha. And uh, thank you all for joining us this morning, looking at the participant list. It's very nice to see so many familiar names. My earnest hope is that someday, someday soon, perhaps we'll be able to do these presentations in person. Um, but for now, it's great to see everybody. Great to see everybody on the Zoom. So I'm gonna go ahead then and share my screen. I've got some slides that walk through some of the key findings. Um, you should now all be looking at a PowerPoint called Spring Ahead, K-12 Parents on the Future of School. Um, as Natasha said in her introduction, this is a survey of K-12 parents in Massachusetts, and this, the project, as with previous waves, was sponsored by a grant from the Barr Foundation. Um, it also included very significant input and assistance throughout the project um, from the Education Trust. So thank you to both organizations for making, making all of this possible. So what is the survey we're talking about today? The results are this, this wave is um, represents a survey of just under 1,500 parents of K-12 parents in Massachusetts. And as with previous waves, we also have oversamples of black parents, Latino parents, and Asian American parents. Basically what that enables us to do is as we're going through the, the survey, as we're going through the results, we'll be able to break out opinion in some detail to be able to understand the experiences of parents across the state in much more detail than we would be able to otherwise. So that's what that's kind of how that's all possible as we're going through. As Natasha also mentioned, this is the sixth wave. You can just get a quick sense from looking at those other dates that basically what we've done is we've done one each spring semester and we've done one more or less one each fall semester. So uh, that's kind of how, how the trend data that you'll be looking at breaks down. Um, it was done in English and Spanish and can be seen to be representative by age, gender, race, education, and region. Okay, so we're going to post these slides on our website. So we're putting key findings in there in case somebody just wants to go look at them, you know, without the benefit of the presentation. Um, but since we're about to get into all this data, for now, I'm just gonna go ahead and skip right over the key finding slides since we're gonna talk about it anyway. So for those who have been on previous versions of these release events, this uh, graph should look very familiar. Basically, the question that we asked, um, which is here at the bottom of the slide, like it is for each um, for each slide, the question was, prior to the coronavirus, do you think your child's academics were at, behind, or ahead of grade level? And then the follow-up question was, okay, how about now? Um, and what the chart here shows, for the most part, is the answers to, to where parents think their child is now. Um, we have 22% in this polls saying they think their child's academics currently are behind grade level, 53% um, at grade level, that's the red line there, and the pink line is the ahead of grade level. A um, couple interesting things about this graph. You can see that it's very similar to where parents thought things were in the October of 2021 wave, you know, not a whole lot of change really since then, but there is some change when you go back to uh, the three waves before that, basically kind of the peak of the, you know, the Omicron wave and a lot of, um, I'm sorry, not the peak of the Omicron wave, Delta, you know, uh, Delta and so forth. Um, and a lot of the remote schooling period also is covered by those three, those three uh, survey waves where, um, 
more parents at that time thought their child was behind grade level. And it's also the 22% is higher than the before COVID rating where you had 13% who thought their children were behind grade level pre-COVID in the very earliest waves of this survey. So it's also a change from how parents thought this school year was going to go. So November 2021, the last October, November of 2021, the last time we did this poll, we asked the question, by the end of the school, where, the school year, where do you think your child will be? At that time, 9%, this number here, thought their, their child would be behind grade level, and 35% thought that their child would be ahead of grade level. Then you fast forward to now and we just ask, you know, how is your child actually doing now? And you can see uh, the same numbers that we just looked at in the previous slide, 22% now think their child is behind grade level. So there was this kind of burst of optimism basically is how we looked at it back in October and November where parents thought, you know, everybody or almost everybody's back in school, you know, the pandemic is much, um, is in a different place than it was earlier. And we think that we being parents think that, you know, there's going to be a lot of catching up and even moving ahead that happens. Whereas now, you know, you look at where parents are now and, and it, it's pretty much hasn't changed in terms of the evaluation of where kids were in October relative to where they are now. So then we asked another similar question, which is by the end of this academic year, do you think your child will be prepared for the next grade level? And we found 80% said, yes, they did think so. And 20% were either, either said no, or they were unsure. Um, so we kind of grouped these together a couple of times in, um, in future slides, uh, just to kind of take a look at parents who weren't necessarily sure whether or not they thought their child was ready for the next grade. Um, how do parents get this information? What are they relying on to, to basically understand where their child is academically? First and foremost, it's what they hear from the classroom. It's grades. You see that at the very top, 76% of parents said classroom grades when we asked this question. 56% said a conversation or a note from a teacher. Those were by far the two most common you know, uh, answers to this question. Uh, much further down, you see you see uh, conversations or notes from a guidance counselor, and you see um, diagnostic assessments kind of right there in the middle. So what's being done about it? That was another thing we wanted to really understand. For parents who think their child is behind grade level, are they being offered any additional support? Um, so we asked the question, has your child been offered additional academic support by the school? Um, and found overall the, the numbers here in this column and in the, in the left column, 31% said that they were offered help and they accepted it. Another 12% said they, yes, they were offered it, but they did not accept it. And just over half said, nope, I was not offered that at all. Then what we did is we broke that out by parents who thought their child was behind, at, or ahead of grade level. And the number that I think is really worth kind of zeroing in on is among parents who thought their child was behind grade level, 52% said that of those parents said my, that their child was not offered additional academic supports. Um, so that's the, those are the parents who think that their child is having academic issues, but there was not additional support that was offered. Then, you know, a similar question is, or, or a question I should say in the same vein is, do you think your child's school is doing enough, should be doing more, or is doing too much to help children catch up who have fallen behind academically? And what we did in this slide is basically break it out among parents who thought their child was either at or ahead of grade level, that the dark red bars you see here, or the pink bars are parents who think their child is behind grade level. So among parents who think their child is behind, you see 30% of those parents say that they think that the school is doing enough. And 62% say that, th that um, the school should be doing more. 62% of parents who think their child is behind grade level say their, their school should be doing more. And you kind of couple that then with what we saw in the previous slide, which is just over, just about half of those parents thought that their child had not been offered any additional support. So I think you kind of look at this slide and the previous slide a bit in tandem, if you will. 
So one of the you know, additional programs that we dug into a bit more was summer plans. Basically, are you gonna enroll your child in any sort of summer learning program, summer school, summer camp, et cetera? We found overall 26% of parents said yes, that's the number you see up here at the top. And then we broke it out by, by different groups to see what percent of each one of these demographic groups said that they were planning to sign their child up for something um, of that nature. You can see that uh, 40 to 50 percent of parents of children with either an IEP or children who are English language learners um, said yes to that question. There's also a very interesting um, kind of stair step up among younger children. So your K to twos, your three to fours, there you saw about a third saying yes, that they were planning to um, to do something like that. Whereas when you get up into the 11th and 12th, you're down to about 14%. Um, you also saw parents of color much more likely to say that they were, they were planning to do some sort of uh, summer program of some kind. Um, and then among parents who said that their child was not prepared for the next grade, they were also much more likely to say that they were planning um, some sort of engagement in summer programming. Among parents who were not planning any sort of summer programming, we just asked the question, what are the main reasons why you are not planning to send your you know, second grade child or fifth grade child to a summer program? And also broke that out by parents who are either prepared or not prepared for the next grade. Among parents of students who thought they were prepared, not surprisingly, the most common reason was my child just doesn't need it, or they have other things that they're, they're doing. They have other activities planned. Among parents whose child, who didn't think their children were prepared for the next grade, the most common reasons were that it was unaffordable, that it was, there was some sort of scheduling conflict and also a similar, uh, similar, you know, they've got other things going on or even that the school wasn't planning it at all. Um, so a, a pretty broad range there, but you know, the two most common were that it was either unaffordable or didn't work for, for their schedule. So then we dug in a little bit to just how parents think the schools are doing on a whole range of different issues. Um, and we just asked them to basically rate the, the how schools are doing on a whole range of different um, items, which you see here on the left side. Basically, are, are they doing well at making students feel welcome? Are they doing well at making, this one's actually a bit longer and the full wording is, is on the website, but making sure the curriculum reflects the experiences and accomplishments of all races and backgrounds, I think was the full wording. And you, know, and you can see here what the other items were. Overall, there's you know, large majorities that rate most of these items either very or somewhat well. Um, I'll be interested to hear from the panel whether, you know, somewhat well is good enough on some of these items, um, but you can see that if you kind of add them together, it's large majorities. But if you are only looking at the percent you say very well, you've got less than half on everything except for this item about making sure all students feel welcome, the one up there at the top. There's a couple others that are worth pointing out. Um, there's two in here where we only cited the numbers for high school parents, you know, helping students plan for and apply to college, helping students learn about career options. Um, you know, those are only high school parents. And then there's also, um, <clears throat> there's two items in here that, that relate specifically to, to diversity. Um, one is something where parents, you know, in relation to this chart, think that schools are doing almost the best, which is, on curriculum and ensuring the curriculum reflects the it reflects the experiences and accomplishments of all races and backgrounds. But then when you're talking about the teaching core reflecting the same, that's actually one of the lowest rated items with only 32% saying somewhat well. So um, kind of a big gap there, I think worth examining a little further. So then we also break the, broke these same items down by whether or not um, parents thought their child was at or ahead of grade level or behind grade level, and just looked at how ratings varied between those two groups. And you can see that parents who think their child is behind grade level, that's the second in each one of these pairings, offer lower ratings pretty much across the board on each one of these different items. So behind grade level, parents who think their child is behind grade level among that group, only 21% think the school is doing very well at offering all students rigorous engaging instructions, instruction. Um, 
you know, 27% think they're doing very well at supporting students with disabilities compared to 44% um, of, of other parents. So there's, there is a group and we've, you know, kind of looked at them in a couple of different ways who is much less sure that, the, that what's going on at school this year is really benefiting everybody. So um, for this slide, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Zana Basma, who did, um, did quite a lot of heavy lifting, coding thousands of open-ended comments into these categories and let her walk you through some of the highlights. Thank you, Steve. So in this open-ended question, we asked respondents what types of supports or resources would be especially helpful to your child. And while we saw a variety of different supports cited, parents seeking academic support rose to the top of the responses. So as you see in the table here, 46% of responses were related to academics, and that broke down into five different categories, being classroom suggestions, affordable tutoring, more academic support, such as one-on-one -on -one help, subject specific help, and then supplemental academic resources that students could bring home and work on with their families. Now, outside of academics, parents cited mental and emotional health supports as something their children needed. Many parents said they're good as is, and others cited additional programming such as before and after school programs, free and affordable resources such as technology and food, and then others citing let's just return to normal. And now on the next slide, we just have a few examples of what some of these responses look like. I won't read them all, but one parent noted we wanted to get her a tutor. Unfortunately, it's very expensive. And as another parent cited, additional learning time, individualized attention with an educator, and continuing learning throughout the summertime. Steve, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Zaina. Another issue which the poll spent a lot of time on is mental health. Um, we this first uh, slide that you see here, the question was basically thinking about your child's mental or, and emotional health this year, would you say you are? And then the bar chart here shows very concerned and somewhat concerned in the percent that that includes. So there is an encouraging note here, which is that compared to February of 21 and October of 21, the numbers are actually going down a little bit. The, the concern level has actually decreased a little bit. However, it is still very high overall, 47%, almost half, say they're at least somewhat concerned with their child's mental health. Unfortunately, we, we don't have this data in Massachusetts going back to before the pandemic. Um, so we can't you know, say this is higher or lower specifically in Massachusetts compared to before the pandemic. But just by way of illustration, I did pull some national data. This is fr data from the CDC that, and the chart is from the Atlantic as it notes here on the slide, that shows that this was growing, you know, that mental health issue crisis was growing long before the pandemic began, um, but the pandemic really has exacerbated it. So the chart here shows the percent of high school students feeling persistently sad or hopeless, and then breaks it down into various groups, um, you know, that were surveyed. And you can see that even before, you know, 2020 kind of being in the middle right here of these two vertical lines, even before that things were, you know, already on a very sharp up, upward trajectory. One thing worth noting is that the issues of mental health and academics are intertwined. They're intertwined closely, they're intertwined inextricably. Um, what this slide shows is the parents who think that their child is behind grade level, that's this bar right here, the percent of those parents who are very or somewhat concerned about their child's mental health. And you can see that the number here is 74% who fall into one of those two categories, compared to parents who think their child is at grade level or ahead of grade level. You can also see that parents who um, who have IEP students or whose children or who have ELL students also have much higher levels of concern about their child's mental health compared to parents who, who fall into neither of those two categories. Um, so just overall, the level's down, but it's still high. And there's specific, you know, specific groups of students, specific families, I think, where concerns are, are much greater even still. So we asked a similar question here to what you saw a few slides back about academics. Basically, have you been offered any additional supports, any mental health supports? Um, and overall, you can see 43% of parents said yes, they were offered some sort of mental health support. Um, among parents who are very or somewhat concerned about their child's mental health, 48% of them were offered some level of support or some kind of support. But that leaves a lot of parents that said no, they were not. Very, a lot of concerned parents, 45% of parents who say they were very or somewhat concerned with their child's mental health, 
say that their child was not offered additional support um, during the school year. So as with academics, there, you know, there's a lot of parents that are, are you know, at least getting the offer for help with the issues their child is facing, um, but there's many who also were not. So then um, we asked a series of questions about COVID, basically COVID risks, COVID mitigations, and vaccinations, um, a, a series of questions on these issues. And there's some differences that I think are very much worth noting and some dynamics and trends that are worth noting. The question here was, how concerned are you that any of your children will be affected with COVID while at school? Overall, the number is about half. That's the bar you see over here on the left side of the chart, but we're either very or somewhat concerned. Um, and then we broke it down. You can see both white, black, Latino, Asian parents. You can also see then that because we did the oversampling, we were, we were able to break each one of those categories or groups down into higher versus lower income. Not further than that, you know, we couldn't break it down into four income categories or anything, but at least we could see, you know, white parents in households under 75,000 versus over. And as you can see here, there's um, much higher levels of concern among lower income households, pretty much across the board. You know, you can see this kind of stair step down in each one of these two pairings where parents in lower income households were more concerned about the ongoing risk of infection. And you can see that white parents were the least concerned followed by Asian parents um, being the second least concerned about the risk of infection, where black parents particularly um, were the most concerned about the ongoing risk of infection. If you kind of keep this, keep these contours in the back of your head, the, they kind of help to explain what the next few slides show. Um, this one, the question is, which of the following comes closest to your view, even if neither is exactly right? And um, the first option, the one you see represented here in blue, is that we should accept more risk in general so our children can have full experiences in school and activities, or we should gem generally limit risk so our children are better protected from infection. And you see 52% agreed with the first overall, 40% agreed with the second one of those statements. And you can see then kind of looking at the breakdown, some familiar contours where white parents and Asian parents were on balance more likely to fall in the we should accept more risk category where black and Latino parents were relatively more likely to fall into the we should, we should generally limit risk category. Um, parents under 50,000 in households under $50,000 were also more likely to be in the limit risk category. Um, and uh, gateway city residents were also more likely to say, or were slightly more likely to say we should limit risk, definitely more than the than rural parents were who were much more on the we should be accepting more risk side of things. This also then comes through in mitigation, basically support for all these different mitigation strategies. Um, there, there's some very interesting ways where the data corresponds between the questions that we just covered and <clears throat> basically support for these mitigation strategies. So overall, there's a lot of agreement on the very top item, providing rapid tests for families to take home. That's what, That one was very popular across the board, 85% plus saying that they support, strongly or somewhat support that program, policy, idea, et cetera. Um, the second one, test and stay, there was also broad support, but not as universally high for sure. Um, and there you see white parents and Asian parents more likely to say that they support that program compared to black and Latino parents who are somewhat less likely to say that. There's still fairly good sized majorities across the board, but that is what you do start to see opinion diverge a little bit on that item compared to the top one. So then you see uh, regular testing, that one has fairly broad support, except you know, white parents are a bit less likely to support it. Um, <clears throat> but then as you kind of go down, you see that the, some of these gaps start to get a bit, bit bigger. Vaccine mandates for teachers and staff, that one you see white parents the least likely to support it. And the big one that we've seen a lot in the news, mask mandates. White par <clears throat> Among white parents, you see 50% 50, 50 support. Among black, <clears throat> excuse me, black parents, you see 80% support. So very large gaps start to appear when you're looking at mask mandates and, um, and to a lesser extent, vaccine mandates for all students. 
The mask mandate question um, echoed what Suffolk University found in the poll that they released this week with the Boston Globe. Um, they asked a similar question about mask mandates on transit and also found in their poll, it was voters, black voters, much more likely than white voters to say that they would support continuing to require masks on transit um, when compared to white voters. So a little bit then on vaccination rates. This corresponds with what state data shows. You know, it's, it, we can't perfectly match up the percentages just because, you know, parents had more than one child and so forth. And the question was a little bit different, but um, in general, the contours of what we found matches the contours of what the state data shows, which is that younger children are much less likely to be vaccinated than our older children. So among parents of K-4 children, for instance, only 49% of those parents say that they're um, that all of their children are vaccinated. 12% um, say some and 36% say none. You know, and obviously some of these parents fall into different, several of these categories. Um, five to eight, you see it goes up to 65% and then nine to 12, it's up to 75%. So definitely a break by age here. Um, there is, uh, I'm actually gonna skip to, um, skip to this next slide because it directly corresponds to what we we're just looking at. Um, there is an ability that we have to be able to tell where impacts are going to be the deepest. And I think that's the, that's the real meaning of this slide and that slide that we just looked at last. Basically, we can see where, if there's another wave, when there's another wave, where are, where's it going to hit the hardest? Um, what sc schools are going to be disrupted the most. And you can see that it's schools with the youngest children. Um, it's to, a, to some extent, gateway cities and rural areas have lower vaccination rates compared to the overall number. You can see that schools in the Southeast, um, which tend to be in the, the most conservative region in the state. And then you can also see that not as much among Asian parents, but um, particularly among Latino, Black, and white parents, there is um, there are differences by income level. Um, this poll doesn't measure partisanship, but definitely have to mention that a lot of this also echoes what we would see if we had also looked at partisanship. So there are some, um, there, uh, there is definitely a relationship also between who is vaccinated themselves and whether or not children, their children are vaccinated. So this is basically parents who say they are vaccinated and boosted and the percent of their children who are either all vaccinated, some vaccinated, et cetera. The percent who say their children are either all vaccinated or some vaccinated. You can see a really strong relationship here between the vaccination status of the parent and the vaccination status of the child. Um, looking, for example, at parents who are not vaccinated themselves, 81% of them say their children are also not vaccinated. Looking then at future vaccination plans, um, right now we have 62% overall who um, say that all their eligible children are already vaccinated. Um, and then looking at the rest of respondents, we see that there's um, that more say more whose children are not already vaccinated say they're not planning to get their children vaccinated um, compared to the percent who say that they are planning to have their children vaccinated. So then we asked basically an open-ended question, why, you know, what are the main reasons? And again, I'm going to turn over, turn it over to my colleague Zaina to just run through what the what parents' responses to this question were. Thanks, Steve. So when we asked parents why they're planning not to have their child vaccinated, the top concern was 32% of parents citing safety, and then that was followed by age and trust or um, risk they see in the vaccine. Um, and then on the next page, we have a few quotes that just cite what some parents thought. I'll read one of them. One parent said, not needed, not enough research, and children do not pose a risk. Steve, I'm going to pass it back to you. And I should just also quickly note that there were, um, you know, every parent in this in this survey, at least one of their children was eligible when the survey was taken, just because, you know, that was the point at which the vaccine was approved for children um, in those age categories. Um, but that is a very quick run through of the poll data. I'd love to answer your questions in the Q&A. Um, and but for now, I'm going to turn it over to Natasha to introduce our panelists.
Thank you so much, Steve. Obviously, a lot to think about here. And, you know, to sum it up, it, it's been another year, right? Um, so everybody watching, please feel free to leave any questions that you have for the Q&A uh, uh, in the Q&A box. Um, for now, I have the pleasure of, we have the pleasure of digging deeper into the context for these results with an expert panel led by my esteemed colleague, Shanti Lopes, Assistant Director for Engagement and Communications for, uh, for Massachusetts at the Education Trust. Uh, Shanti, welcome, and I'll let you do the honor of introducing our panel. Thank you, Natasha. I am pleased to introduce to you all our panelists, all of whom are deeply invested in the work of improving both health and education here in Massachusetts. I've had the pleasure of working with many in them, and I'm really excited to begin introducing them. And I'll start with uh, Renia Wilkinson, who is the Director of Family Advisory Boards at School Facts Boston. Hi. Hello. Next, I will introduce Yuritza Rizzo, who is the community organizer at Lawrence Community Works. Hey, everyone. And lastly, I will introduce Michael Curry, who is the CEO of Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers. Good to be with you. Hello. Welcome all. So before we unpack uh, the poll findings, which you all uh, saw the results and heard from our colleagues over at Mass Inc., it would be great if briefly, um, in a minute or less, you could just tell us a little bit about um, yourself and the work that you do. Um, I'll start off with uh, Vernier. Hi, um, my name is Renee Wilkinson. I'm with School Facts Boston. And um, the work that we do is to gather and engage um, parents and students around education topics to hear them out on their concerns and support them in advocacy and to share uh, education information with them. Great, thank you. Um, Yuritza? Hi, um, my name is Jaritza and I am a community organizer at Lawrence Community Works and I work closely with parents um, to prepare them to engage in an active role of leadership and uh, participate in decision-making um, opportunities within their schools and districts. Um, and I also work closely with teachers and schools um, to give them the tools as to how to uh, create a relationship with parents um, in their schools. Thank you, and closing with Michael. Thank you, Chanti. Um, So Michael Curry, I'm the President and CEO of the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers. Of course, on the front lines in the last two years, responding to COVID-19 with the testing, contact tracing, uh, vaccinations, boosters, getting vaccines to the arms of young people. The other hat that I wear relevant for this conversation is I'm the chair of the National NAACP's Advocacy and Policy Committee. So I'm deeply engaged in education policy issues, both here and across the country, and had the opportunity under Mayor Menino and Mayor Walsh to work on some of these deep educational issues that pre-existed COVID-19. Thank you very much, all of you, for um, sharing a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. Uh, so to begin, um, the first question, and anyone could just feel free to jump in, um, I want to first open up the floor for general reflections. I'm curious, as you uh, both looked at the survey data and also heard um, the family poll results, was there anything in particular that jumped out at you? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll chime in first. So I think, you know, so much in this poll. So I think I want to first start by saying thank you again uh, to Mass Inc. because they've been uh, critical partners uh, in the state in making sure that we get information timely. And of course, um, the work that the Education Trust does is critical to this. And I want to say thank you as well. This is Teacher Appreciation Day and Teacher Appreciation Week. So we can't start without acknowledging the critical work of our teachers. There's so much in this poll. One is the challenge that we have of acknowledging the impact of this uh, pandemic on our children, um, that they haven't had the resources that they needed, um, that they are dealing with mental health challenges that pre-existed, as was said, COVID-19, but are now exacerbated by the impact uh, of this pandemic and that we're not getting them the resources. I think uh, for every parent who says um, um, that they're not getting the resources that they need or they don't have the mental health supports, that their children aren't getting the, the, the educational supports they need, um, that should be a warning sign to us that there are ripple effects on this 
on our workforce issues within the state of Massachusetts and across the country, uh, on our achievement levels, as some of these kids will go on to higher ed uh, and will struggle there as well because they've not been given the tools uh, and the support they need. So there are all kinds of things in this report that are um, affirming, uh, or at least confirm, I should say, much of what I've talked to with teachers and parents. Uh, and then last but not least, we listen to parents, which I think is the critical part of this poll. They don't always get the pedagogy. They don't always understand MCAS and all these other nuances of teaching. But what they do know is they know their kids. And this poll centered them to understand what they're thinking about uh, the last two years and their children. Thank you, all, I, um, all really valid um, points. And I wanna give the opportunity to our other panelists if they had anything else, again, that um, uh, spoke to them or, or jumped out of the results. Yeah, thank you, Shanti. You know, I looking at this poll, I would say that um, personally, I think that none of it was surprising to me, um, not only in working with parents of typical students, but working with parents of children with special needs. Um, it's always been a concern, um, you know, the lack of resources and the lack of, you know, awareness as to what is being offered um, and what can be offered to our students um, to improve um, not only their academics, but their mental health and their emotional um, status. So, you know, I, I think that this poll only confirmed um, everything that parents have been saying for a very long time as to what their ch children need. Um, so to me, uh, personally, it was not, um, but just um, a confirmation of what parents have been reporting for many time, for a long time. Thank you. Um, I would say my, my thoughts are along similar lines of um, how often do parents have to continue to say the same things over and over. Um, specifically, I was seeing the notes around um, summer support and summer learning, saying that there's schedule conflicts, it's too expensive. Um, and then there was like a, a large group of people that polled in like the other category. And from um, our parents, I think that other category that we've been hearing the most is transportation, not enough transportation being um, offered for summer programming. And then around scheduling, um, not enough before um, program care and after program care being offered so that it can sync up with the parents' work schedules. Um, and these are things that we heard verbatim from many parents um, about a year ago. So it's like, how often do they have to say these things over and over and over again um, before their needs and the things that they deserved are really going to start being addressed? Thank you. Um, it's it's really interesting that everybody um, sort of elevated, um, uh, you know, that the the, the polls families identified um, resources not being um, just uh, at their, you know, being able to access. And I think that was one of the things that was pretty striking to me in the poll results is about half of the parents who believe their child is behind grade level said that they were not offered resources, which is about the same as parents who thought their children were at grade level. So you all mentioned the need for resources and we know that there are resources available. Uh, so my question is what can be done to ensure that all families have access to these resources and what role do community-based organizations play to help ensure that family have access, um, and not only access, um, that I, they are aware of the resources that are uh, available. Uh, anyone can feel free to jump in. Shanti, I think it's been uh, my experience, at least in, in our city, that um, there is sometimes, you know, a lack of transparency when it comes to schools um, providing this information to parents. Parents actually need to step out um, of that school um, setting to find out what resources resources are available. And I think that as a, as nonprofit organizations, I think that one of the things that can be done um, is to actually um, educate our parents and our community as to the things that um, they can be doing within the schools um, in those leadership roles. Um, and not only that, but also. Um, make them aware of the things that um, the resources and the tools that they are available for their children. I think it's very important, um, especially, you know, myself coming from Lawrence and the community of Lawrence language um, is a barrier. Um, and sometimes we find many, many parents that are not aware um, because there is a language barrier. And sometimes 
these parents go under the radar because, you know, um, they don't they don't ask the right questions. And sometimes they don't think that they um, are entitled to those resources. Thank you. And maybe to add to that, so I think one of the things we know is effective because it's worked in the past is organized parents. You know, how do you get parents the information they need and then help to resource them in a way that they can mobilize and organize around what works best for their kids? So we need to start thinking about what are those community based organizations that need the kind of support credit to the Boston Foundation and some of these other uh, philanthropic organizations that are resourcing people on the ground, in this case, particularly parents, because what we need next is to ask for social emotional learning to address some of the mental health challenges that kids were experiencing pre pandemic but are now worsened by the last two years. We now need to make sure parents have the resources and can advocate for themselves to get the resources to get to summer programs. We, I saw the affordability uh, challenge uh, that the parents mentioned in the survey totaled up to, I think, 58% or no, scheduling was 58% cumulative of all the reasons around scheduling, 33% around affordability. Those can be solved. Um, the thing that I think parents bring to this conversation is so vitally important right now is a sense of urgency. Because uh, sometimes our policy mechanism, mechanisms work too slow. Policymakers tend to take their time to figure out what they think. Can we afford it? Is it the right system? Is it the right approach? When parents organize, they can say, no, we need it now. We need supports for our summer programs now, educational opportunities. We need tutors now uh, to make sure that we're not dealing with a deeper deficit for our children. So I think one is just resourcing community-based organizations uh, so that they're empowered to advocate for what they need. Thank you very much. Um, Vanir, anything you would like to add before I move on to the next question? Um, I think the only thing that I'd like to add on is just the idea of, um, you know, we're kind of talking through the, this in a way where there's programs out there and we need parents to be more informed, but I would like to see, um, you know, a world where it's happening more the other way around, where you start with the students and families and say, what programs do you need and how can we build those programs for you? And then you're already starting with their needs. You're already starting with their interests. You're already starting um, ideally in their native language. You're already starting in their community. And you're not kind of like fitting the thing that you have assumed is the solution into their lives. They already know the solutions. We just need to do a better job of listening to them. Thank you all for your responses. Uh, the next question is, the poll was conducted when the case counts were relatively low, yet uh, the survey findings reveal that COVID concerns remain. Um, also, parents are divided on whether to prioritize safety or getting back to normal. Uh, so I would like to start with Michael. We know that COVID isn't over. Uh, what do school and district leaders need to think about as they prepare for the next school year? Um, and how can they prepare for future surges? Well, one, and I thought the, the survey was um, revealing and that we don't see this pandemic the same way uh, as parents um, across age, across gender, socioeconomic status. We see this pandemic very differently. So we talk about accepting risk or limiting risk. If you're a black parent and uh, you, particularly if you are a lower income black parent, you're living in a household that is multi-generational, that is congested, uh, that may have a grandparent or a mother or father living with a comorbidity, uh, diabetes, cancer, uh, maybe immunocompromised. This pandemic doesn't look the same. We're having the conversation around uh, uh, how do we have mitigation strategies in our school? It looks different for me. Uh, I know that I need to make sure that when I send my child off to school, that my child is safe, but also that my child doesn't contract the disease, bring it home, and then my, grand my mother, his grandmother, who's 77 and dealing with several medical issues um, is not impacted by that. So we have very complex um, uh, issues and challenges. School systems need to acknowledge that. They need to say, what do your family, what does your family need? And, and maybe that is reinstituting a math mandate in a school if the rates go back up. Maybe that is rapid testing in a school district when the numbers cross a certain threshold. Maybe that is uh, uh, education campaigns within the schools around vaccination of children. Go to the CDC website, get the information you need. As a parent, schools can help facilitate that and say, here's the information. We wanna make sure that your child is vaccinated and the adults in your home are vaccinated 
to keep them safe. So there's a lot of work that's being done. Community health centers are working with school systems. School systems and city government are trying to have a concerted effort to make sure people get what they need. Thank you, uh, really, really helpful. I'm also curious, um, Vernier and Yaritza, I know you guys work with families um, daily. So curious, uh, what advice uh, would you offer families that are conflicted on what to prioritize? And I'm, and I'm sure you are already doing that. So just if you can share with everyone here today, um, some of the advice or, or what are you saying to families to, to um, help them uh, sort of uh, get their mind at ease or prepare for next school year? Yeah, um, families continue to have a lot of um, high concerns around COVID and, and rightfully so. Um, so like one thing that we think has been interesting in listening to pa parents and families and um, seeing their experience over the past few years is how quickly um, support around on online learning dropped off. That dropped off at the beginning of this school year. So in most um, communities and in most districts. So if we're seeing that this is a cycle, that COVID's not going away, closures are a possibility in the future, then like what are plans for online learning when we need to maybe push that button again? So many of us don't wanna have to do that again, but many folks are also, you know, in a realistic understanding that that might be something that would be um, a resources that a resource that could come back into play. So if that's the case, what did we learn before where we can make it better going forward? Like if you know everybody needs to learn fourth grade math, do we need 50 teachers teaching fourth grade math? Or are there a number of students that can click into one link and kind of like consolidate some resources and consolidate some learning so that if we should need that resource again or if a child is home, um, either they've tested positive or some of their family members have tested positive. Like, how can we keep things going without basically starting over from scratch if we have to readdress online learning again? Thank you. Yaritza? Uh, yeah, Shanti, you know what? I, I was thinking of this because, um, at least in my community, um, numbers have never been low. Um, our numbers have always been high. Um, so it's always been... Um, talking to parents about being informed, uh, getting the, the correct information from the right source. Um, in, our, in our culture, it's very easy for rumors and, and, and stuff that is not, um, you know, um, confirmed by the, by the medical field or um, by the, the, the right resource. Um, and, and sometimes our population and, and, and our communities can get misinformed of, of what's been happening. Um, so, you know, it's always working with parents to make sure that they're going to the right um, person for the information and staying um, involved when it comes to the schools. Um, it's always been in our community, it's, it's been a struggle because it's mostly, you know, this is what the state is mandating. Um, parents don't have, you know, a choice. Um, although we've seen an upbringing, you know, of parents coming up and stepping up and saying, you know, we want um, to be part of those decision making um, and making sure that our children are safe in the schools. I, you know, it, what Michael said earlier um, resonates with um, my home. You know, um, I, my child has a heart condition and, you know, that was something that I waited very heavy on me, whether I was going to send my child to school or not. Um, and she's still wearing a mask. Um, and she keeps telling me, you know, when am I going to be able to take this mask off? All my other um, friends are not wearing one. And, you know, and I have to constantly remind her of the risks that are still out there and in our community. Um, so it's 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 really just giving um, parents um, the right information. And and if you know, if if I always tell them and if you don't trust um, what the person is saying, don't just take it because it's someone in a leadership role, you know, go to your doctor, go ask your pediatrician, have those conversations with those people that are actually gonna give you the right information and not, you know, just not, you're not listening to your neighbor um, about what they're doing. Um, everybody, every family is unique and every family has um, their own needs. Um, so I always encourage, and we encourage parents to do, um, go out and speak to the right people. 
thank you all for sharing both from a professional um, lens and also for being very candid in some of your own experiences and how you've been able to navigate what your family is um, really important. Um, I think all of you mentioned, you know, um, the need to pay attention to mental health. Um, so the next question is the poll results show that parental concerns regarding mental health challenges remain at crisis levels with 48% of parents saying they are very or somewhat concerned about their child. Yet about 49% report not being offered any counseling or assistance. And I think we all know very well um, how important it is to prioritize mental health in general, but I think especially during um, these trying times, these last couple of years, especially for young adolescents. Um, so I'm gonna start off with Veneer. Uh, parents of students who were um, behind grade level were even more likely to be concerned about their child's mental health. Uh, what do you think the takeaway should be for school and district leaders? I think the takeaway should be um, to speak to one of Michael's points er uh, earlier is um, it needs to be addressed urgently. Um, you know, if we're talking about mental health and we're talking about um, students that might be not feeling well about themselves or not feeling well about their situation, like we don't we don't need more information. We don't need to wait until we're on the other side of a crisis uh, to be more attentive and to be more responsive. So hopefully there's ways to think creatively about building mental health supports into the day-to-day -day school experience. And it's not necessarily something where you need to be pulled out of class or something where you have to um, kind of so-called field othered. Hopefully there's creative ways that it can be built in and integrated into the work. You know, um, humanities leaves a lot of space for that um, in art and in English, you know, let's study a test, this text, this is what this character is going through. You know, let's take some time with some appropriate counseling support in the room to talk about what you're going through and what your neighbor's going through and process those things together. Um, in thoughtful, mindful, and um, responsible ways. So um, urgency is definitely the utmost here. And um, I think it's meaningful not to, to, just to reiterate, not to do those things as add-ons, but to really integrate them into the class day. And, and, I, would, and yep. I would say Rebecca Lee Crumpler, who I quote all the time, she was the first African-American female physician during reconstruction. Um, uh, the 19th century. She said, they seem to forget there's a cause for every ailment. It may be in their power to remove it. I'm going to morph her quote and say, they seem to forget there's a power for every situation that a student doesn't achieve and doesn't thrive. And it may be in our power to remove it or address it. And the reality is mental health is a key part of that. When you say 49% saying that they don't have the, the support, the mental health support isn't offered. Um, by their school system. That should shock us all because the reality is we knew students, students were dealing with a major mental health challenge pre-COVID. And we know we are personally, whether we're thinking about our own mortality, about making paying our bills, uh, how do we adjust the risk of contracting the disease on our loved ones and, and as, on our loved ones. And then to know our students are also dealing with that on top of having to perform uh, and show up in school and make friends. We know now that we should have always prioritized mental health in school. Hopefully we adopt this like we did telehealth, like we did working remotely. We adopt that our children need mental health supports and they need it now. And we need to prioritize it in our policy, whether that's city hall, school departments, uh, Beacon Hill or Capitol Hill. Uh, we gotta demand that mental health in our schools be critical uh, to overall student achievement. Thank you. And I'll just, I, I think you mentioned um, the need for state and local leaders to really prioritize mental health. Um, just want to add on, do you, what role do you think community, uh, uh, community based organizations can play to be able to help ensure that families have access to mental health resources? Michael. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, ultimately, and we have a great state, you know, when I think about Massachusetts, but even across the country with some of the other folks, um, you know, making sure that we, one, convene uh, community-based organizations to say, hey, here's the challenge, right? Let's walk through, and the, the Mass Inc. poll is a great example. How do we convene folks that, let's walk through what the data is telling us. And even though we think we already knew, there's something different about seeing the data laid out in this way. Then we say, okay, what are the policy responses to this from a community-based perspective? What do we think we, 
can do with government, can do with philanth the philanthropic community, can do with the business community to really move the needle in Massachusetts. One of the great things about the state of Massachusetts is we like to lead. We don't like to follow, uh, which is why we do a lot of things first in Massachusetts, um, in sports included. Um, and one of those things that we like to do is we like to set new policy that becomes a trend across the country. We should make this one of them. How do we work? The pandemic, we realize in the pandemic that when we work across lines, we can do amazing things, right? We got vaccines out. We've uh, educated communities about vaccines. Let's now deal with the crisis that our kids are facing in school with access to summer programs, mental health support, uh, academic achievement, thriving to their full and highest potential. And I think community-based organizations are the center of that. Uh, if we resource them and get them a seat at the table. Thank you very much. And I'm just gonna close with Yuritsa. Uh, what can, uh, based on everything that you've heard from your fellow panelists, uh, in your opinion, what do you think that uh, districts can do to create a safe and nourishing school environment that supports students' physical and mental health? Um, Shanti, you know, this is something, this, this, it's very, very, something that I've, I've been always um, advocating for within our district, um, because I think transparency is number one. Districts need to recognize the power that parents have, um, the ability that they have in leadership, and that parents' voice is needed at every one of those tables when they're making decisions based on our children. Um, and I think it's, you know, an opportunity um, that COVID, um, I would say COVID brings to the table to make sure that people are aware, um, you know, like mental health, you know, mental health was not something, uh, this is not something new, but we've always had mental health issues. Um, it's been around forever, um, you know, and COVID just kind of like opened up a can of worms. I, you know, it's, it was an issue pre-COVID um, and COVID just made it worse. And so my, sometimes I ask myself, were we prepared back then when we said we were um, in the districts, when we worked with children with mental health? Um, and now to add, you know, the physical and emotional piece to that. Um, and, and, and it's just, we have to learn from this to make sure that in the future, um, we provide what we need to provide for our children so they can learn. Um, because it's not just coming to school and learning math. There's just so much more that our kids get from the school setting. And I think that that is very important that we, um, that we have to be um, more proactive in involving parents and making sure that we have their input and their voices being heard. Um, and not just also, you know, we say heard. Yeah, sometimes they, they, they hear us, um, but they don't take us in consideration when it comes to you know, making that plan, um, to making sure that um, what we are saying is being implementing, um, you know, with children with special needs, we we live that day in and day out. You know, there is a process, there is an IEP process, but how many times parents are actually um, putting some of that input in there, and and that's a perfect example of you know what has just kind of gone from special ed and just kind of spread all over. Um, our districts. Um, it's what special ed parents have been living for years. Thank you. Um, sadly, I'm sure uh, many of our audience members will be, feel the same. I really enjoyed um, being able to hear from all our expert panels, but we are at time. So we're going to transition over to the Q&A. I do want to wrap up by saying, Vernier, Yuritsa, and Michael, thank you so much for taking the time um, to share your perspectives, to, to help us unpack uh, the family poll results. I think both the, the results and also all your feedback and recommendations can really help ensure that our students and our families are at the center of our decision making. And with that, I will hand it back to Natasha to field questions both for our Mass Inc. team and also for our expert panel. Thank you all again. Just want to echo Shanti's uh, thanks to Yaritza, Verne, Verne Michael, um, as well as Steve uh, for his present, for his super informative presentation. I've just a couple of questions I would love to, uh, to bring up and kind of if all of our panelists and presenters could stay on screen, that would be great. Um, 
So the first question I want to ask is just to get the the opinions, especially of our of our panelists. Uh, and I think you heard Steve cue this up a little bit during the presentation. One of the things that the poll asked was how parents would would rate how their schools are doing. And for example, welcome, making sure that all kids feel welcome in the building, and making sure that the curriculum reflects the perspectives um, and accomplishments of of all. Um, of all races and of folks of all races and ethnicities, right? And um, providing everybody with rigorous instruction. And what we saw was that about, at most, about half of parents said that schools were doing very well. And then a chunk said somewhat well um, on each of these metrics, right? So it's half of making kids feel welcome and then less kind of for, for, the, other, uh, for the other questions. How would you sort of, how would you assess those responses? Are those good numbers? Not so good. What are some of the takeaways for, for schools and districts, you think? Maybe I'll add, um, I think when taken in context of the other question, it's concerning, right? So somewhat well is how I would view it. If you ask me how my school's doing, I may not want to be too critical of the school, though I don't feel necessarily that they're responding with the academic rigor, that they're responding with um, the social emotional learning, with the um, diversity and engagement around the curriculum. So I think what parents, when they say somewhat well, I think that should let us know in the context of the other questions, which are alarming, that there is something to be concerned about. So I'd say, you know, for all of us who are looking at the data and the massing polling, uh, we need, need to unwrap that now and start to ask the question, what does that mean? What are you seeing in your child when they come home, whether it's the grades, the MCAS results, you know, the, the key indicators, I'll call them, that parents are looking for to know that something is going well in the school system. What is it that you're seeing and what are you concerned about? And let's unpack that and make sure that we get you the answers you need. I think that is the critical part. So somewhat well is not encouraging to me. Thank you, Brene, Brene or Yorisa, do you, um, anything you would like to add? Just wanna make sure to create the space. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree that um, that's not an acceptable number for how many students are feeling welcomed within their school environment. And I wonder if the students aren't feeling welcome, does that mean also their parents and guardians aren't feel, feeling welcomed as well? Which means the entire family unit um, in a place that the children spend the majority of their time, um, don't feel connected, supported, and don't feel like it's an environment that's set up for their success. Um, that's, you know, when you, when you say like, oh, 50% are doing great, you know, the other 50%, that's the other side of the story, um, are not doing great. And that's actually the more important part of the story. I would also add the culture um, because culture plays a big role and a part in this. Um, a lot of our communities are composed of many cultures where they believe that school best, uh, the school leaders and schools know best. Um, so sometimes it's, you know, you're getting parents that are answering these questions and they're saying, yes, everything's fine. But, you know, that is not where I step in. That is not where, you know, culturally they think that, um, their role is just at home as a parent, as a provider, as a, you know, um, taking care of their children, but they don't take, you know, they don't step in into the educational um, area because that is the school's responsibility. So sometimes I question myself as to, you know, whether these parents culturally think that everything is fine because school knows what, know what they're doing and I shouldn't, you know, bother with, you know, with what, I believe, or I think that they should be doing. And, and Natasha, just a quick point to add to that. So one thing I think that happens sometimes when we're critical, right, as advocates, as organizers, as parents, is, is people sort of feel overwhelmed with that, that it's an attack on the school or the teachers or the administrators. I think we have to change the way we look at that and say, okay, there's a deficit here. There's concerns here. How can we um, aspire to do better? Right? And I think if we approach it that way, then even what's in this poll right, that we're not doing will not be taken as an attack, but as an opportunity. So I just wanna st stress that because I've been on the other side with administrators mm -hmm. and with teachers and say, well, you know, we're being asked to do a lot with a little. We're being overwhelmed and we're not appreciated and we should do all those things, resource them and appreciate them. 
but also set a high bar for our children because we only get one chance at a child, right? That, that eighth grade is that eighth grade, right? We need them to learn at the level that is appropriate for that level. I have an eighth grader going to ninth grade. I don't want to take risk with my child. So I think it's important that we acknowledge their challenges, but also set a high bar that we work with them on. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, last question today. So uh, one of the big benefits of this poll is that it allows us to disaggregate the data by a variety of family characteristics from race and ethnicity, income, geographic area, and so forth. And we certainly saw some big differences in the poll results on multiple questions across, right? And one of the things that that highlights for me, at least, is that sometimes, you know, statewide and even in individual districts, we make decisions based on the averages. Um, and that, that obviously may not work for all of our families. What are some of the ways that you think policymakers could, what are some steps policymakers could, could take to make sure that they're hearing and engaging and truly kind of authentically incorporating the, um, the experiences of the entire, all of the communities that they serve? Before we get into the answers on that, I just have to give a quick shout out to the Bar Foundation on that because that's not cheap. Like doing the survey this way is not an inexpensive thing. So kudos and hats off to them for supporting this. It's something that we in the survey community have seen a lot more just in the last few years, which has let us know more about public opinion than we've ever known before, you know, and know it in more detail than we've ever known before, that it's not an inexpensive proposition. So again, just thank you to the funders for this, for um, letting us know about the state in this much detail. And I'll, and I'll just chime in with uh, one and echo that uh, credit to Jim and the team at the Bar Foundation for the tremendous work that they do in this space um, that gives us the, the support that we need to really address these inequities that happen in, in our education system. So that's one. And you know, I think what's, what's critical for us right now is that um, that which gets measured gets done, right? And there's all kind of versions of that. But if you measure it, if you uh, disaggregate the information, so you're looking at women, uh, young women, uh, young boys, um, LGBTQ, um, go across all the demographics, um, where we might not, not see an issue in the, in the broader numbers, you'll see it when you dig in in the specific subpopulations. That's where you can make a difference, right? We know that inequities exist, but in order to deal with inequities, you gotta unpack that and get to the specifics of, uh, and I thought ELL and uh, IEP was a specific one that stood out to me in the data that uh, Massing uh, presented uh, around um, across demographics. Students feel persistently sad. Um, and then he got into uh, the demographics of that and higher with IEP and ELL, English language learners. That's important, right? Because now we can target resources and policy and attention at those people who need it most. So um, we got to unpack that data and credit to Massing for doing that. Yeah, um, I think I'll jump in here for a moment just to name like a bit of um, maybe discomfort and I appreciate being here and being here um, as a guest, but the discomfort around the, the cost that it takes, the, the investment that goes into this sort of data um, because it's an investment in populations that have been underheard for generations. So it's not actually like, oh, like, you know, we're paying for something that's relevant. We're paying for something that's actually past due. And the impacts um, have been um, very deep. And we know that that also connects to household wealth and generational wealth and generational poverty and that sort of thing. So. Um, yeah, these are these are funds and um, support that are generations in the making. So we're glad to be here now at this point in the conversation, so that ideally we can move forward into more progress. Yadisa, I saw you come off of mute. You're gonna jump in. We can't seem to hear you. All right. 
Well, I'm sorry about the technology challenges. I encourage everyone to take a look uh, at the chat. We've got a really live conversation moving in there. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for your insights and your comments today. Thank you to all of you who were able to join us this morning. Um, I hope that you will keep an eye out for announcements from the Massing Polling Group about similar future events. Uh, we are really, really hopeful that to be able to continue bringing similar conversations, similar cr critical conversations to you in coming months. Thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Again, this recording um, and the slides will be posted on Massing's website. So uh, please be sure to check that out and uh, take care everybody.